Okay, let me introduce uh, Dr. Jake Dubrov, who is a, an associate professor of radiology. And within radiology, he is a nuclear medicine imaging and therapy division member. So he's a nuclear medicine physician. Which is, which is a whole other lecture. But thank you. Thank you for, for inviting me. Um, uh, I, I, I know it's hard for Hank, who's been doing this longer for me than, than I have, but um, I actually started, and I'll talk to you about that a little bit, in brain imaging when I was 18 years old. So I've actually, I'm at the point of, this is my 30th year, actually, brain imaging research. So I was literally, you know, everyone's level here when I started, and I just couldn't stop doing it. So it's it's my own problem to work on. Um, but in terms of what, you know, we're at the Centers for Studies of Addiction. So I'm going to give you a little insight in terms of um, my job and what I do with 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 PET and also um, also, uh, you know, how we use PET to, to study addiction and some of the, the challenges and some of the things we've learned kind of very broad. And so the more interruption you do, the more interesting it is for me and for you guys. So I like I, I welcome questions. This should be a very kind of going back and forth. Um, I'm trying to you know, I think about when when I knew not as much as I know now, but I still feel like I don't know anything at this point. Mm -hmm. um, and so I thought I thought I, I hope no one got in the like you guys saw about the the article that got sent out, right? The second half was a lot of math, and I didn't want you guys to get bogged down in that. I thought the first half was a really nice lecture. It was a I think did you see that paper? It was a, it was a Carson overview paper on time yeah. imaging. It's and, in, I should read it. Yeah, it's a, he did a nice, <laughs> nice job. Um, and so I thought what would be good um, uh, was to, uh, you know, talk about what, what Im PET imaging is and how it works, because I think some of the other speakers probably touched on it, uh, positron emission tomography. Um, how does it compare to other tools? So I'm going to talk about that from a physics standpoint and also compare it to uh, fMRI a little bit, which I'm sure you've, you've heard a lot of. Um, and then what kind of questions can we ask about using uh, about addiction using PET imaging? So, um, and, and I kind of I broke that down in a way that I think was is helpful for your level. So, how does it work? All right. So, this is the article I looked at by uh, Jacob Hooker, who's at um, MGH, and Rich Rich is a Rich Carson's a guy at Yale that we work with. He's a really um, uh, really wonderful um, uh, PhD. In uh, his instrumentation, but he he loves neuroscience, and so he lead, he's led the, the he recently stepped down has led the Yale Pet Center, which is a really uh, incredible pet center for for a number um, for a couple of decades. Uh, and so this diagram is kind of the overview which we have to process. And what one of the challenges that I face as this kind of nuclear medicine physician doing translational research is I kind of have to know all the different moving parts. So they have to work together because at the end of the day, we're making these radioisotopes and we're sc scanning people on an instrument. But the radioisotopes, because they have a physical half-life, are always decaying. And so we make this thing, we have to test it to make sure it's okay to put in people, but it's time can be our enemy. So you have to make sure everything's lined up. And then there, there's, there are some hazards you can trip on along the way. And so when you want to do science, what's, what's the main thing we look for when we, we do something in science? Or we, we're looking for. We want to look for you. And you invent a good test. What is a good test? Something you can replicate. Replication, right? Over and over again, the same thing. And so, how I approach a different patient whose disease is the same or healthy control might be a little different, but like I want to do the same test on every person. And if you have a lot of moving parts, it can be a challenge. And so, you see the steps here. So the first thing is we have this cyclotron. So literally on the Penn campus, we have a nuclear reactor. For the cyclotron. Now that was, um, uh, I think Lawrence, uh, Ernest Lawrence got the Nobel Prize for that in 1939. And it's talked about in the movie Oppenheimer, which I haven't seen yet, but maybe you guys will see, but it's actually, it's a, seeing Bar you, you're seeing Barbara. Yeah. You're not going to do the back to back. <laughs> Bar you're not going to do the Barbenheim, Barbenheim. <laughs> where, where pink to the A-bomb. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> But the idea is that how do we 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 accelerate these particles? And and for me, I know some of it, but I don't know all of it. Is the actual physicists who like maintain the cyclotron? And then we have to we we get this radioactive, what we consider the the federal uh, excuse me the Food and Drug Administration considers to be a a, a drug, um, even though it doesn't change our participants, but it has to be as a quality control. Like we 
if it's a medicine, you want to make sure it's okay before you put it in a human being. Uh, and then we put it in the human being, we scan the, the person. So there's, there's steps on the way. We want to do these steps every single time um, the, the same way. Uh, the, the, the really neat thing about the field is, uh, in terms of me, in terms of how I think about it, and I think Heck has seen this, and, and he hadn't done a lot of pet research until uh, a couple of years ago, and now understanding all the different moving parts, is that you have people who are experts at the instrumentation, the, the posture on emission tomography detector, and that is um, basically a very fancy radiation detector, which is very sensitive and can show things in a very kind of precise spatial uh, way. And then also the radio chemistry, the people that make the different and invent the different types of molecules of drugs that allow us to see different processes. And so those two things are converging. And so I try to look at both at the same time and see how we can really novelly apply these to different disease phenotypes that we're learning more about. Um, one of the, the cool things uh, I always remember is, um, you guys ever seen that guy on the, on the right there? Horseshoe crab, right? So if you look at it's no, that, that guy's alive. No, I said I only I only seen him dead. Oh, well, you want him alive. <laughs> so how, how much? So the, the the horseshoe crab. So there there have been some surrogates made, but um, I think it was in 1977 the FDA changed how we tested drugs before we put them in human beings. So before we did it, as Peta will show you, we used to inject things into rabbits and see if they got fevers or infections, and then we'd know that they had that you don't want to inject that into a into a human being, right? And they take, you know, so you take part of a batch and put it in a rabbit and see how the rabbit does. So oh, that's okay, that's not okay. Well, when you're dealing with a radio step that's a half-life of 20 minutes and you have to figure that out, you need something that you can do fast and practice with. And so uh, the, the, lim the limulus is a very old, ancient, I don't know how many billion years old animal, but it has this particular protein that uh, in, if you, it, it will make basically um, a solution very cloudy very quickly because it'll react with it if there's some type of uh, antigen in that solution. And we've had a couple um, good attempts, but that's used a lot. And we have to test the drugs before we put them in human beings. So you can, there are different, um, we can go off on this too, but there's a uh, different NOVA episodes you can watch. Basically, we collect horseshoe crab blood to this day. All right. And there's different labs that do it and they draw some of the blood and then they put the crab back. And that blood can basically go for like, I'm sure it's up to 30 grand a quart right now to do that. So if you can have something that will rapidly figure out if there's an ant antigen, if something is safe to inject, you could make Jeff Bezos look poor in a way, because um, it's something that's a big demand for free man. But we, that's, a, that's one of the steps along the way. So there's all these different steps before you can take this radioactive particle, make it into a, a drug, and then make sure that drug is safe to test in a human being. And so um, to, to put it in and, and then put that in and take pictures and then analyze the pictures. So this is just another diagram of the get up here. So, oh, that was an accident. So um, this is the PET detector, which is a ring. Okay, and then the, the positron. So the positron, what that does is, um, sorry, go back one. We want, we're detecting these two photons that uh, are moving um, outside in opposite, direct opposite directions. And that's what, after this annihilation event. So you have a positron and the positron immediately annihilates and goes opposite directions into two photons. And that's what our machine detects. And this is just showing you, this is the cyclotron again. And this is our most common tracer, uh, fluorodeoxyglucose, which is a glucose analog. Um, now, what I do in a lot of my clinic is I look at patients with cancer because different types of cancer use a lot of glucose. Um, and this is just an example of a patient with a uh, probably a non-small cell lung cancer, a big mass here. And then you can see on the other side, they have this hot spot, which is probably a lymph node. And from there, that gives us uh, cancer staging, restaging, which everyone has heard of, but it's different for each disease. And it gets pretty complicated, but cancer staging lets us know how a patient might do in a couple of years. Like what's the prognosis of this patient? Different type of, it's called a prognostic biomarker. Biomarker is a word that you're going to hear a lot of buzz of, but it's good to go back and think about what a biomarker is and two main types, predictive and prognostic. And this cancer stage is prognostic. Predictive biomarker, so prognostic biomarker is going to tell you how a person's going to do, and a predictive biomarker is how a patient is going to react to a specific treatment. If this is going to, if they're the right um, uh, phenotype, 
for that treatment. Okay, but you can see that this is um, this is PET, and then with our machines, they're actually CT. They're a hybrid machine, so it allows us to get function, the glucose, and the form, and we fuse them together, and the patient is slid in, slid in with one gurney. That's a relatively that's occurred about twenty years ago. Before we just had PETs, it's been a very um, I think beneficial uh, development in instrumentation for us. I have a question. Yeah. So with PET CT, why is MRI required beforehand? Oh, for our for our studies. Okay. So our studies is because CT does not do a good job at the finer structures in the brain. And for us to look at gray white, to look at some of the midbrain structures, CT does okay, but it is not it, but um CT is density. density. Yeah. MRI looks at actually protons, basically water, and can do a lot more uh fine instrumentation. So that's how we really can understand, make uh, interpret our functional pet data a lot better in brain at least. Um, clinically, I read it off of CT all the time. So that's a good question. Um, actually here at Penn, we did the first FDG picture. It was not, there was no actual pet instrumentation. It was kind of like this other type of uh, instrumentation before it had pet, but this is the first time that FDG was injected. Uh, and that was August 16th, 1976. So we're coming up on a uh, anniversary. And then, um, we had another anniversary here, and uh, which is a different instrument that we're developing. And this is, you can see this it's kind of longer going on. And one of the, the neat things about, um, as I said, you have these things that are happening in radiochemistry and instrumentation. And um, a typical PET machine, maybe, you know, 10 years ago looked like this, where you have this ring of detectors. The ring is the very expensive part of the detectors. So, you know, we bought a new PET machine, I think in 2018. Very good machine. I think it was like two and a half million dollars to do that, right? And a lot of that expense is that ring detector. Well, what happened is that we have a physicist here, Joel Carp, and he worked with an, uh, another uh, another physics uh, physicist um, and instrumentation specialist at, at uh, UC Davis. They developed this this whole uh, body um, uh, a pet uh, detection. So your ring went from this purple ring to here. And this is actually a, a, the the machine that we we use for a lot of research. And so it's not just two dimensional. Yeah. Did any of you go over and see it? Mm -hmm. We did the MRI. Oh, you just saw the MRI. Yeah. 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 Okay. Well, maybe we should work out a time for that. A lot of people are leaving this week, so oh. it'll probably help me this week. Yeah. Well, we'll, Which, well, we can we'll pull the group and see. We, we can see. Yeah. Um, we can see if we can squeeze time. Um, but as I said, like in that two-dimensional ring, we saw the, the 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 photons being detected this way. But now with this bigger ring, we have all these other photons that we can get. And so actually we gained uh, three to five times as much sensitivity, which can be a lot uh, from an interstation standpoint um, in, in doing that. There's a lot of other advantages that we gained, which get into different technical things, but I think it's, a, it's been a really um, interesting uh, development here. Um, so, how does pet imaging compare to other brain imaging tools to ask questions about addiction, right? Because addiction, if you look at the NIDA definition of addiction, there's it's a fundamental neuroscience question. There's some type of change in the brain that makes you do this reinforcing behavior at the expense of other things in your life, right? That's kind of something precise. That's how I think about addiction. Um, and so one of the things to look at is we have to you know, then I have to think of my physics and and we think of energy and wavelength, right? Gamma rays and microwaves and radio waves. So down here, you can have MRI. And those are those are bigger radio waves that we're tweaking to kind of look at how protons are are are, are wiggling and kind of listening for them to, to come back to their normal recess. Um, and then further on, we have this, this PET CT instrument in which we're looking at gamma rays, right? And then we've done this CT with, with this with other X-rays and we've kind of merged the two going on there. So I think it's important to think about, you know, what type of energy we're trying to capture. And there's, there's all, there's, there's pluses and minuses for each time. Like, even though I use this, these pet radio tracers, which have uh, definitely more dangerous energy, then there's a safety issue that comes into account. So I have to worry about how much radiation people are being exposed to when they do this. And that's always going to be part of doing human research. Including yourself. Including myself. Yes. I wear, I'm not, it's in my bag. But I wear a radiation badge, and so I get that checked on a, a monthly basis to, and, and by the environmental health and radiation safety here to make sure my limits are okay. Now, the type of radiation 
and part of my training is also different types of radiation, right? Like Hank knows me from, we do all this imaging research together, but also in terms of nuclear medicine, imaging and therapy, we're using all different types of particles. We actually put much more dangerous particles in human beings who have certain types of cancer because we try to use that very elegantly to kill the cancer. The, 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 the way, the, the most established way of that has been around since 1941, which is radioactive iodine used for thyroid disease, cancer and overactive thyroids. So um, it's, a, it's a way. So we're, you have to know your physics and then the, all the detectors that we've developed the past couple of decades are kind of based on those physics and how they work together in, in, in understanding your image and your data, right? Uh, this interesting story, I, I, I was on call this weekend and I had, uh, I had a call case and just an argument with another guy who's reading MRI and I'm reading a PET CT and making sense of what's going on with this different patient because they're saying, well, I, I look at this, this, this part under the MRI physics tells me it's this. And I'm saying, no, it can't. I'm looking at the PET and the CT and it's telling me this. And this is what I know about biology of disease. So you get in these very interesting discussions about what um, these different physics signals are actually showing you and what you, how you apply them bio, to biology. Does that make sense? Yeah. So if I remember correctly, um, you use MRI to see like the structure of the brain. They use PET scan to see like a faster like activity. So then... we'll, we'll get, well, we're gonna get more to that. So the PET scan is actually, um, it's radiation. Right, I'm taking a very nice operation now. MRI, you can get lots of functional inform information, as I'll going to get to in a second here. Um, we use a, ve a very basic amount of the MR because we need to understand where the radioactivity is. So we so um, we can take a patient and move them from one machine to the other, and we can co-register the brain because your brain is pretty rigid, right? If I was doing that for bowel or for a different part that kind of moves around a little bit, I'm not gonna get the same localization. So even when I do a PET CT, sometimes there's movement of bowel, or the, or, you know, we don't want the person to move around because it makes the physics a little bit harder to, to, um, to interpret the image. But um, there's, there's lots of layers in information in each modality. And part of the complexity, which I didn't understand how complex it was until I got into it, is understanding that there's different parts of the signal for both PET and MR that you have to take advantage of at different times. Um, and that's been that's been shown over time. So to, to get deeper, yeah, go ahead. In the case where you're saying that there's differences between like what the MRI says versus the CT and the PET yeah. scan, what do you go with? Or oh, you have an argument, but it's like it's in it's it's interesting, right? Yeah. It's like because you're in that in that case, you're worried about that. That's like a clinical apl applicable thing going on there and then you you have to you have to put that information in the into the hands of the person who's managing that patient and making decisions say okay what what is the best thing to do with this patient and this information so the oncologist um yeah this it actually so the story was this weekend that i um i was interpreting someone who had myeloma which is a lymphoproliferative disease and i found this um new kind of hole in their in their head that they didn't know about and it it um had this very uh, round um, calcification that was new from the prior study three months ago. And the person also had a history of a heart arrhythmia and was anticoagulant and some pretty powerful stuff. And so, um, but it was a weird place to have that. And his myeloma had gotten a lot better in the three months, but there was this new lesion. And so I felt it could be a brain bleed. So I actually spoke to the patient on the phone and had him come in the hospital. He's actually getting an angiography this morning. Um, but the, uh, but if it was myeloma, I should, it should have a lot of glucose metabolism, but it didn't have any glucose metabolism. It was like, there was nothing there. Um, and the, the MRI was interpreted over the weekend and said, you know, well, first that they did a specialized CT because my CT doesn't have intravenous contrast. And there are all these different ways you can, you can play with the parameters requiring your CT to really understand what's going on vascularly. Um, and they were like, oh, this is probably a, um, this is probably a bleed. And then they got an MRI on top of it just to, to really characterize it. And the last word, the last line in the in the um, in the report was cannot exclude solid metastasis. I got I got a little irritated. Mm -hmm. uh, we'll say that. So I actually wrote to the who, who wrote that report? The, the, the neuroradiologist. Yeah. Yeah, so yeah. I actually I wrote to the neuroradiologist and the fellow who interpreted it. I said, I was, I was nice. I couldn't <laughs> not kind of diplomatic. I'm like, 
Well, first, first of all, why do you think this is metastasis? Because the patient has myeloma. I consider myeloma to be a lymphoplift disease, not a solid tumor disease. So kidney cancer or um, lung cancer or prostate cancer, like yes. it starts here, goes to the lymph nodes, then goes somewhere else. I'm like, that's not how myeloma works. So are you writing this because you don't understand the fundamental biology of the disease? And I said, it's also not FDG Abbott. I didn't say that, but I was kind of like, <laughs> I was what? like, I was like, I want to, I want to say that. I was like, That'd be such a nice, that'd be such a good burn, but no, it's not good. <laughs> then it's in an email and the time I said it every day. So, so, um, but basically, uh, I, I think the was there an oncologist managing this? There's a neurologist, so there's a lot of people, there are a lot of people involved, yeah, because it's a bleed. He got a stroke protocol and he was on, he's actually in the right. neuro ICU, but who, who's managing the myeloma? Other than oncologist, in the loop. his myeloma looks great. I'm not worried about his myeloma, I'm worried about his the oncologist knows biology, right? But not, but apparently, not my. No radiology cover, but that's fine. <laughs> that's fine. Um, and, and so, right, he's getting an angiogram right now. They're actually going to uh, do this thing where they dynamically inject contrast dye and actually see what's going on here. Because apparently, he was a bigger guy. He had a hi history of um, he played football, and apparently, you can get these weird bleeds if you have traumatic brain injury. So they're wondering if his old. He's probably like seven years old. If there's something going, if there's something between the anticoagulation and the bleed, it's an usual place for a bleed. Um, he was. You know, you, you, we don't, I don't want him to have blindness because of where it was in his brain. He could have cortical blindness. And so it's kind of, I'm um, kind of, it's a, occipital, yeah. Yeah. It was, a, it was a very interesting case, but kind of like working, it's a good example of how the different signals, they don't tell us exactly, right? The, the way I think about, um, and what I'll describe to you, functional MRI, and this is not to insult functional MRI because where I started, is it's a footprint of a shadow, right? Like it's not a direct signal, right? You're not looking at that is, very few things we do is a direct signal. We have to build evidence as scientists to figure out exactly what is what are the phenomena that our instrumentation is telling us. See, it's like Plato's allegory of the cave. You know, the, how we know what we know. How we know. What we know. You, know, you see shadows on the wall of a cave, right. and that's how we infer what's right. going on in the world. Right. Like, before PET was a thing, yes. I guess, like, what was the basis for someone to like make a hypothesis, I guess, that like injecting someone with a radioactive ligand will allow me to like image their inside? Well, uh, there was, I mean, that was the, that was the 1976. That was the first time that happened. Yeah. So, so it, it, it didn't exist. Yeah. I mean, someone came up with that. Say, let's put in some radioactive glucose and we'll do this other instrument we have and see if, if it, we get a picture of it. It's a good idea. I mean, but that's, I mean, there wasn't as much IRB regulation then. How, how many FDG scans are done at Penn daily? Or oh, daily? Week? Like I have clinic in the at, at let's see. So a busy day for me is I'll read 40 something, which is a lot. That's a lot. Um, I would say within our health system for FDG PET for oncology, because there are other types of PET scans. We do stress test now with them too. We're going to look at probably... 200 and my guess is there's 200 there's either 50 or 60 a day wow um and that's going to keep on going up that's just fdg because because what's happened is remember i talked about develops in radiochemistry so we have the instrumentation and so drug companies are very interested in looking at better tests so in the past 10 years there's been all these new tests invented including a new one for prostate cancer that came out last year and that's there's a big need for that so we're getting a lot i get those it's not like one thing stops, the other thing starts. It's just more. So I was joking with uh, Emily and um, Rachel. I said, academic medicine is the hot dog eating contest where the reward is more hot dogs. <laughs> you really like to eat hot dogs. <laughs> like, here's a, here's 12. Now, you like those? How about 24? You nauseous? No, here's another 48. So, um, that, 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 but it, it's been remarkable because it kind of like, I did this research on the field before when I was an MD PhD student. And, uh, and I can tell you about that a little bit, my, my path. And it really made me think about what is it. And I saw how it was going to change the field. And now in this field, 20 years later, it's like all these things that I thought were going to happen are happening. And it's like, oh my God, it's, it's a lot. It's really scary. Um, one of the things to think about also with comparing these different modalities, not just what we see is they have, they have again, different you know positives and negatives, but how sensitive they are, right? So CT, you're looking at density, right? Bone is really dense and lungs aren't dense at all, right? And to see a change in that, it's kind of one times 10 to the minus two or minus three. 
So it's a pretty sensitive change you can look for, right? And then compared to MRI, it's like, well, MRI can be maybe a hundred or a thousand times more, right? But then you get up to PET and you really see the changes we see can be a million times more sensitive and more than MRI. So some really subtle things we can see. Um, and that has a lot of implications. For one, for one, you can you know diagnose disease earlier from when you design a clinical trial and you put on your research hat now, you're gonna have to say, well, I wanna test this hypothesis and I wanna see, and I think it's gonna be this much of a difference. How many people in these two or three experimental groups do I need to enroll to see that difference? Well, if you have a much more sensitive instrument, you're gonna be able to see that difference a lot bigger with a smaller group, right? The problem is the PET is a bigger pain in the ass than MRI, and so, and it's much more expensive, for example, to do. Um, so it becomes a challenge. Like, how do you balance that equation going on? But to, yeah. How expensive is it actually to run? So it, it to, there's so many different things about costs, and it's like that insurance building. It's very expensive. How much would it cost for like someone without insurance to get it? Yeah. So that that's a that's a that's that's an interesting debate right now. These are these are all good questions. Why right? don't you just answer for in terms of what our costs are for research? So well, those change too is the new new year. I, yeah. I I think maybe clinical is best because then it would okay. make. Okay. So I would say an FDG PET scan of the body, the insurance would get a bill for the neighborhood of two thousand bucks, right? Twenty two hundred bucks, right? You're like, oh, that's so much money. Okay. If I told you the cost of the, dr the the drugs that they're using to make those decisions, right? Or like, okay, let's say you're gonna go take out a lung nodule on someone, right? How much is it gonna, how much is the hospital gonna bill the insurance for someone to have a thoracotomy and the surgeon to take out lung nodule? 10, 20 grand. Oh, it's gonna be more than that. 20, oh, it's gotta be like we're gotta be hitting six figures to use the OR and everything yeah. like that. And then the pack to cut it up under pathology and all that other stuff, right? So my point is. It sounds, like an psychiatry, you know, it's, it sounds like an expensive decision, but the downstream decisions are really expensive. So you guys, everyone watches TV, right? And we're one of the two countries in the world that allows drug companies to advertise, right? And have you seen those? Yes. yes. Oh, us in, yeah, us, like in, us in New Zealand, like... billions of dollars a year. So everyone has seen those, have you ever seen that drug Optivo? And it's like more life. Well, we use those <laughs> ingredients who are really like really sick right like terrible lung cancer right how much do you think that drug costs a year 89,000 ballpark it's like it was like 140 grand 150 grand right and the co-payment so even if your insurance pays for that the co-payments might be 30 percent right so 30 percent for someone who's like retired or doesn't have that kind of income like that's a lot of money so if you're asking me about a 2200 dollar test where I can show you whether or not a $150,000 uh, intervention, which has maybe a 10 to 20% benefit and a huge side effect profile is worth doing. I'm not the bad guy here. And plus I'm not, the, I'm not allowed to order the tests, right? I'm not the one ordering the tests. They just show up and I interpret them all. Okay. So it's, it's a, it's a good question. And it's also- How much does an MRI cost? It can, it can be a thousand bucks, 1500 bucks. Depend, depending what you're, you know, you can MRI all different parts of the body for different reasons, okay? But and but that, that can see a lot of things that PET can't see. Now, there are people in research and in clinic that say they know they become experts in a certain modality, and they think that modality, it's very dogmatic. That modality is another thing. I try to maintain the humility that PET cannot solve all the problems in the world. I really like it as a tool. I've dedicated my professional life to it, but it's not perfect. Okay. Uh, sorry. I just want to let you uh, move on to your, yeah. because we only have about yeah. 25 minutes. But this is fun. Yeah, no, it's great. Did, did, I, did okay. I get it? Your question too? Okay. All right. I'm going to skip to that. So, okay. Bold. Like you've all seen the fMRI bold, right? Um, and, and so what you're looking at is it's a very strong magnet. And the difference between oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin, when hemoglobin gives off its oxygen because the brain needs it to accomplish uh, energy for neurons to function and glia to function in the brain, we see that dip. And traditionally there's been this, what we call a boxcar uh, lineup where you don't do something and you do do something. You don't do something and you do do something, right? That is kind of the basis, okay? And actually I started in this, as I said 30 years ago, this is actually my brain, all right? And I did a little study 
Yeah, you know. So I've had I've I've had well over fifty, might be approaching a hundred MRIs at this point. I haven't done one for a while, but I like and I looked at so many that I was like I could you know oh that's so and so's bright you know there's there'll be the people that look at so you, you think it's funny so, so on, on, on the on the on the left here is an experiment where I did this boxcar design and I was touching sandpaper and I then I'd say stop and I stop touching sandpaper I touch the sandpaper again so we used both my motor cortex and my sensory cortex. And then on the second part, I was just sitting there and they said, okay, now think about touching sandpaper. Okay, stop. Now think about touching sandpaper. Stop. So it was activated imagery. So imagery of the sensation activated the primary sensory cortex. And we've seen that in a bunch of things. That's how I started in the break with this, this concept of imagery. So when you talk about like all these things like professional athletes and motor rehearsal and all these other things, like it's rewiring those circuits, it really is. But looking at what MR was really cool doing that. I, I don't think I could design the same study with PET. That would be really hard to do. So different question. So I said different tool, different question. Okay. Um, the other type of MRI we like to do is this thing called resting state, which is we don't have them do on and off. They just sit there and say, okay, this person, we characterize this person. This person is um, a heroin addict. This person is an alcoholic. This person is a healthy control. This person is male. This person is female. Okay. And we look at one part of the brain, they, they call this a seed, and they see what other parts of the brain are behaving exactly like that part of the brain. So they must be connected somehow. So they pick up these connection maps that way and say, oh, does this person with this disease look different than the healthy control in that connection? All right. You guys have had some fMRI stuff here. So I'm not, this is not foreign what I'm saying. Okay. Good. All right. But the fMRI machine, so who's had an fMRI? What's the thing about the fMRI? When you, is it very relaxing when you're in the fMRI? No, it is so loud. The echo player scene is bong, 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 right? Just like it's like it res, so it's really loud. So, so all of a sudden you stop doing them, start doing something. So, you have someone who's like might be withdrawing from a drug or something like that sitting there. That's going to be really hard for them to do that. And you have this other layer of stress that also comes into pet and talking to people who, because we are dealing with, with the radiation. All right. Finally, what can we ask about pet? All right. And so I kind of broke it down to a couple uh, uh, a different uh, uh, questions. And there's more than this, but it's basically whatever you can design with your radiochemistry to look for. What, what, what physiologic or pathophysiologic process can you look for? So one is metabolism. And I've, I've bummed uh, some slides off the director of NIDA, um, uh, Nora Volko, who looked at cocaine use disorder and saw that she, there was kind of this globally depressed metabolism, especially in this orbital frontal cortex, um, and this was, this was done a while ago, this is pet brain. And she also did the same thing in alcoholism and in and, and studying uh, that alcoholics um, had kind of a little bit less metabolism and then an alcohol challenge and something different to the metabolism brain. Okay, so that gives you a clue to, to how it's going. How it's going. Um, we're on the cusp of this, and you're gonna, I, I was gonna go with the question earlier about um, cost, if you wanted to pay cash for it. Because if you've seen the news, the other thing that we've been working on is this new medications approved for Alzheimer's. Okay. Uh, that and it's been debatable, like, do we give them, do we not give them? They're expensive. Well, the way we can really test for the presence of these proteins is with tracers that have been developed in the past 10 to 15 years that look at this abnormal protein accumulation. Uh, and one is um, uh, beta amyloid, which we know occurs in these sheets extracellularly in patients who have. Alzheimer's disease, and one is another intracellular uh, accumulation of this protein called tau. But we have PET scans that can detect that now. And so they use those to monitor treatment and see if see if patient, so it's a predictive biomarker, so when to start the treatment. And then also they're starting to use them when they stop the treatment. And that's a very interesting question. And that also comes into cost because if the, if the treatment's going to be expensive and the testing's going to be expensive, which one, who's going to do what? That hasn't been solved yet, right? A whole new field. It's not like we have a whole bunch of money stowed up somewhere that we want to release to do this. No. Um, so protein is something that we're going to be running to. And one part of our brand together, we have a pilot study. We're hopefully we'll be looking at that soon, which is current in, in, in soon. 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 Yeah. All the bureaucrats, they give me such pleasure in science. It's highly regulated. Yeah. The level of regulation, not just IRB. I'm, I'm going to get into that. Oh, okay. 
<laughs> okay. Um, here's another one, synaptic density. So this was a tracer that was developed at Yale. So the first paper, which uh, is just on the left, just shows you epilepsy sub subjects, which is obviously not an addiction phenotype, but to show you that they, they showed where they thought the epileptic lesions were, they had less synaptic density. On the right, they did. This is actually uh, Gustavo did this paper and, and really, yeah. Um, and it was, uh, he's someone we collaborated with at Yale. And they showed that in cocaine use disorder, there was like less uh, uh, less synapse formation um, in this uh, lower uh, median medial frontal lobe going on. So another way of measuring a disease phenotype. Um, and then, but the big thing that I think Pat has contributed is, and, and in drugs, is that you give a drug, and, and the reason drugs are potent is because they act with receptors in your brain, okay? And so part of the challenge here is, is, is understanding the receptor, which it just gets more and more complicated. Receptor biology is very complicated. And then figuring out which radio tracer you're tagging to. So one of the protocol, prototypical ones was dopamine. We have a lot of different tracers, and dopamine is at kind of the end stage reinforcing neurotransmitter. Um, and this is just showing you that all these, these are all different radio tracers. They're not all approved, but they show you different parts of this prototypical, this cartoon prototypical synapse. So the question is what you want to study in that synapse. And I think that makes it very interesting. And I think the the, the example I, I gave here um, is, is showing that, um, and you can see here, this little bit more red here. You guys see the red down here? You would agree that the top row is a little bit more expression, the more intense color. Then here, and this is the, the corresponding MRI. This is a this is a well, parametric map, so it's a bunch of patients who are summed into one common space to show you that representation. And basically, in cocaine use disorder, you have down regulation of your dopamine receptor, at least availability. Okay, um, and we know that cocaine directly acts with the with these dopamine dopaminergic receptors. Uh, and and actually, people have radio labeled cocaine before, and I'll, I'll talk to you about that in a little bit. And here's kind of another another uh, showing the same thing uh, but what they also show you is that here's the healthy control and, and they show you one month after cocaine use then four months after cocaine use so the receptors are slowly starting to normalize to come back so they were down and they're coming back up so the question is you know hank in his role as an addiction psychiatrist okay we understand the phenomenon what intervention we can do to lead to that normalization then to make the person's behavior back to normal Okay, and how can we prevent them from, from relapsing? The same thing. Yeah. Can receptors go back to being fully normal how they were before the we, substance? That's a great question. We don't know. Because the big part of it is also there's this thing called cues, which I'm sure Anna Rose Childress was here or someone else is they're going to talk about cues. Like, do you see something and it doesn't matter what your receptors they're normalized? You just have to go do that behavior again. Gen Ouch. Yeah, mm -hmm. generally, yeah. It just this craving just gets wired and you're just like, I gotta go do this now. I gotta smoke that cigarette. No way. Right. And so um, it, 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 you're looking at one receptor, but again, you have, you know, literally like four or five billion neurons in your brain and they're all interacting and then in the in environment. So we try to understand one. And then here we're looking at obviously populations of neurons, but it's really hard to say that. But what, what can we what we can do is we can give a person we want to give a person the best shot at that normalization. I think that's that's the key. Yeah, yeah I was gonna ask how long it takes for like those receptors to start like um like upregulating. Uh, I don't know exactly. I'm the wrong person to ask. You know, do you know what that is for? Well, it, it here, 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 yeah, here is see it's for a period of months. Yeah. So that that way, if you're actually gonna correct this disease, because it's one, yeah, this is one month after last cocaine use, and this is four months, and you want to get this red in, yeah. increased um, so, so over, yeah, yeah over time. Just curious, are there like interventions that have been studied that uh increase or like like speed up the rate of the uh repopulation? That I that I don't know. I don't think so. Yeah. That's something I'll I'll give you another example, the same thing. Okay. Now we get to the Colombian tricolored poisonous tree frog, who you all expected to see today. Uh, and why did I include him? Well, part of the lesson, and this goes into part of the regulatory, is that um is that uh we, these are drugs and they have toxicity on them. Uh, and there was an incident that happened at Columbia 15 years ago where they were not doing a good job regulating their tracers and they got kind of shut down. And there was an issue with, you know, getting consent from patients who uh, don't have full capacity to get, give consent, might have a surrogate. And so that creates a very, we want to always behave in a very ethical way when we do these studies. And there are a lot of 
kind of um, uh, there's a lot of steps to getting them approved, okay. as as I told you, I was going to get there. Um, um, and sometimes they can be very painful and very annoying. We we'll try to do them because we want to make sure that we have we strike that balance uh, in in the right way to do that. Now, when we put a drug in, like we put radioactive cocaine, or we put this toxin, which I from this Colombian tree frog, or a derivative thereof, to study our our nicotine receptors, we don't want to label all the receptors. Okay, so when you take an aspirin because you have a headache, you're getting a, you're looking at your COX one or COX two pathway. For those of you who have looked at pharmacology or studied some pharmacology, there's a certain amount of receptors, and you want to have interactions. You want that drug to interact with those receptors. Okay, usually it's like 30, 40, 50 percent to get an effect. Right in PET, I don't want a reaction. I want one to three percent of the receptors labeled because I just want to see how the system is behaving. I don't want to change the behavior of the system. So that gives you, so we have, we can have very toxic things that we give them very small mass. So we are playing with fire a little bit, but if you have a good chemistry and you know what you're doing, and I always have an antidote in my pocket for anything dangerous I'm playing with, know what to do and you can do it safely. All right. So that was an example of people who, who were on the brink of not doing something safely, but that's something we put considerable resources and time and frustration and hours into making sure we're doing everything safely. Uh, the example for tree frog is one of the ways we, we learned about um, uh, of, of this is is doing this mapping. And they had someone, they mapped their brain and they had them smoke a cigarette, come out, smoke a cigarette. And they looked at their brain again. You could, and they could see different amounts of mass here. So a tenth of a cigarette mass. It's about 1.3, 1.5 milligrams of nicotine actually in a cigarette. So they, the, the more mass, the more displacement, the actual nicotine would kick the radio tracer, which had binded the receptor off the receptor. Okay, so that was a neat way of learning about the receptor. And what they, they found from the, this type of manipulation is that we learned in cocaine use, the dopamine receptors are downregulated, but in nicotine abuse, the nicotine receptors are upregulated. Okay, and we're still, and again, how do we take advantage of that? Um, this also happens with vaping, it's a study by our friends at, at Yale too. Vaping knocks it off also. So when you introduce nicotine in that way, it, it, it gets into those receptors in the brain. Um, this, this and another study I'll show you, uh, pre-treatment, you have this upregulation receptors, where they did CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, and everyone gets these, the more intense colors mean a higher uh, expression of the receptor, basically. Okay. Um, uh, before they get treatment, they have a lot of receptor availability. And then after they have cognitive behavioral therapy or bupropion or even placebo, these are just the people who are successfully, and it's very hard to treat nicotine dependence, you see there's a downregulation of the receptors. <clears throat> so you get that, so again, normalization. How do we get to that normalization? This is what PET is telling us. Um, same thing here, look at the, this is, these are the two different uh, the interventions, placebo versus nicotine, but it doesn't matter, the non-quitters versus the quitters, the quitters have downregulation. The non-quitters do not have regulation, that downregulation, okay? So to successfully quit, you need to downregulate down -regulate those receptors, all right? Um, so that's a that's a really interesting phenomenon about about nicotine. So we had cocaine, nicotine, and just a little bit on because we Hank and I collaborate on uh, opiate use disorder. Oh, you know, huge cause of opiate related deaths here, right? Um, I, lung cancer, which is the number one cancer killed in the United States, is one hundred and twenty five thousand a year. Automobile accidents are probably forty thousand. So significant OD problem we have here. Um, but again. Uh, uh, receptors are in the brain, but they're also opioid receptors are throughout the body, right? Um, and we did this study where we actually gave, uh, and this is something that's ongoing, we actually looked at the mu opioid receptors using this C11 carfentanil, which is a very potent agonist of the mu opioid receptor. And uh, we did a number of subjects where we blocked it by giving basically Narcan ahead of time and then did the same injection. We saw what the displacement was and we knew that the average <laughs> dose. And we can calculate that. So you can count you can calculate kind of your receptor occupancy and displacement by doing these type of studies. Um, the really neat thing is we did it on the Explorer instrument, which I showed you guys in the past uh, already. And that's something that no one's been done before. So we can look at how, how it's everywhere. So who here has taken BLS or ACLS or anything like that? Has anyone ever done that before? Yeah. You guys know for acute uh, life, support. life support. Yeah, life support. Well, not, yeah, not ICU, but like someone goes down. So when someone was on the suspected coronary event, do you guys remember the acronym MONA? 
No. Well, basically, part of it is morphine because there are actually opiate receptors on the heart. And we think if you activate those, you can dilate coronary arteries. And so that's what you're looking to do to restore blood to the heart kind of going on. So, um, but no one's been able to measure that before. We haven't. We just really looked at the brain to do that. Hard to do. Um, and then we can measure the percent of the block and the different organs here. Going on there. Uh, okay, yeah, so I'm about done. Let's be. So why did I show a picture of the 1992 Dream Team? Because I'm a basketball obsessed? No, because does anyone, write, so Chuck Daly, anyone, I've done the sending before. Chuck Daly, anyone who Chuck Daly is? He's the NBA lifetime coaching achievement coach. Well, Chuck Daly coached in the Flustra over here on next next year from 1971 to 1977. He was the pen coach here. Uh, but my point of showing this is that none of this research gets done alone, um, that you need your own dream team. And we need an updated dream <laughs> team to make sure this is one shows me much more follicularly gifted. And I've aged a little bit with different personnel. But you need a team to do this. You don't do, this is not one person doing this by themselves. You know, I mean, um, Hank and I go back and forth about whether or not different patients are eligible and is this going to work or not going to go work and we have to utilize each other. It's just, I have the same view about the imaging modalities. Like I, I can't go without the MRI. I can't, can't, PET can't go itself. Like they're really powerful. But you have to rely on a group because this stuff is way too complex. It's, we're not, we're not in like the, the Victorian age of some scientist in a little vacuum, like playing with molecules by himself. Like that doesn't work. It, the science doesn't work like that anymore. It's a lot of communication. It's a lot of interpersonal um, exchange because these studies get really complicated really fast. The other thing I'll tell you is about failure. And I think this is a good thing to keep in mind. You will all fail in your careers at some point. I failed multiple times in my career. All right. If you think you're going to go through your career and not fail. You are not being truthful with yourself. All right. I think failure and, and as, as a dad now with teenage boys, I love using sports because it's a great opportunity to learn failure and learn persistence in those things. So I like showing this letter, okay? Dear Dr. Marshall, right? We we, were, we, we have to reject your abstract. 67 were submitted and we only accepted 56. So F you because you were in the bottom 15%, right? <laughs> right? Anyone know who Gary Marshall is? Gary Marshall won the Nobel Prize for discovering H. pylori as the cause of gastric e reflux, okay? So keep your FU letters, okay? <laughs> because you're going to need them to say, I can do better, I can, uh -huh. I'm going to fail, but I can figure this out if you're persistent about it. If you think it, it's not going to be failure, there's going to be failure. But failure has to be an opportunity to learn. That's a great letter. I love it. There's another, I have another, I have two other letters. I have one rejection for different Nobel Prize, but I also have one from New England Journal to Anthony Fauci and Francis Collins, who used to be director of... Um, NIH. And this was in, the letter was in May of 2020 about, there, we don't want to hear about a COVID vaccine. That's what the letter was about. It was like, we reject your editorial about a COVID vaccine to the director of the infectious disease and the head of NIH. Like, you might be right. Time will tell, but stay. If you're focused and you're passionate, it will be. So great questions. And I'm happy to answer anything else you guys about that. Yeah. So how many scans would you look for in a study? You'd be like, okay, we know what we're seeing is like probably true. And you know, they would probably so again, again, it's 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 using it's it's being disciplined and using um, the null hypothesis and knowing your type one, your type two failure. You know, we want to direct the null hypothesis. We we're expecting to see a twenty five percent difference in this phenomenon. We're going to design our study to detect this twenty five difference within a certain amount of power. And so we need to get so many. So maybe I'll need 10, maybe I'll need 20, maybe I'll need 30, depending what I'm looking for. But that gives you insight because sometimes for some of these MRI studies, there are dozens because the signal is much smaller. So you have to look at that together, which was what I was saying about cost <laughs> and time too. Yeah, but it, it all depends on the study, you know? So, I mean, I think for the study I showed you, it was, it was nine. And we showed a block in the heart and a block in the spinal cord. Never, no one ever did that before. And it was not a complex study design. But you can't expect that you're going to solve the problem in one study. Like, I think that's what you find out. It's like you see these people that use great steps and it takes decades and you're standing on other people's shoulders and you're working. And 
a lot of people always know a lot more than you see. So a certain amount of humility you have to take. What do you think will help reduce the cost in the in the next 10 to 15 minutes, maybe. We have some type of well, so so let me let me go back in one step here, which is the FDG I showed you is something we use clinically. But all these receptors, all these other studies is not something we do clinically. And you can't just a doctor can't write a script and order that, right? That's the entire so research and clinic are very well marketed here. Um there is going to be a push for these tests because we're seeing how like the, am the amyloid test is going to um, offer people hope where there was no hope before in diagnosed disease. And so there's going to be pressure to do that. The question is, how do we pay for it as a society? Now, every year um, we end up getting like, oh, there's a 3% decrease in CMS reimbursement centers for Medicare services, right? So at some point I can't, you know, I get paid to do this job. I, I feel like I get a, a deserved salary, right? Um, if I was in private practice medicine, I'd probably get a lot more salary, but I, I'm very happy with the salary I get. Uh, at the same time, I'm not a charity, right? I didn't I didn't try to be the best student, go to the best schools and do a double doctorate so I could get paid, you know, $15 an hour to do this, right? For, and, and invest 30 years of my life in this. So what is going to be, how, who are, how are you going to pay this? Me as a physician, I want to get paid. And how are you going to pay for all the other people to, to, to deliver this care? That is a really difficult question and I can't answer it. But I will tell you that I don't see, I don't foresee a future with fewer scans. I see a future with more scans because we're seeing more and more of the benefit of, uh, of how we understand disease and how we can treat it. So um, it, it's, the scan, they're gonna make the scans keep cheaper and they're gonna pay me less, but they have to make them more readable. There has to be some type of margin there for us to do them um, and, and not be losing. I have them. a question. Yeah. How much will AI impact your interesting? So, so what? There's a company that's tried to use AI to say, "Oh, you have an older, crappy scanner. We can use AI, and your pictures can look much nicer." Right? But I'm like, <clears throat> we don't have really proper scanners because we develop a lot of instruments and. We will be because we do such a volume here. If we buy a new scanner, we pay for that scanner within a couple months because of our volume. So I'm not interested in AI, I'm interested in physics. Well, making I'm imaging. thinking of AI in terms of diagnosis, of, yeah, in terms of like research. So, so, yeah. so let me tell you what I think about quantification overall because I've done research on quantification, um, and, and diagnosis, and I see AI as the same type of tool. Right, how much amyloid is in the brain? Like you can do different ways to do that. So, um, so the best thing I can do as a diagnostician is look at the same data and come to the same conclusion. Right, and that's what I, AI want would want to. Okay, the staging in this patient, I think that's a metastasis, and, and this is the conclusion I've come up to. Right. We talk about that in terms of reliability, right? Getting, we talked about we want to test, we want to reliable. The thing about imaging, medical imaging, is there's some subjectivity to it because if you have one interpreter versus the other and even versus yourself, right? I want to stay within and, and be reproducible in getting the same answer for the same case, even though every case is a little bit different. I also, it's also like we're big enough practice that I can't read all the cases. So, if you and I are colleagues, I want us to also arrive at the same conclusion and have and minimize just both the inter inter in, yeah, inter, inter <clears throat> observer and inter server reliability. And I think what I've seen in quantification is that um, is that sometimes it can give you insights into uh, a case that you've you've gone through, and it can also make you more consistent in how you approach a case as using it as ancillary information. And it can also help different observers approach a case and end up with the same conclusion, right? And if it can also do help me do that faster, it can be helpful. I don't foresee a future where it's just like there's no person imaging and we let the computer figure it out. I, I don't I don't see that. The medical histories are too complex. I mean, teaching that I. I so I'm uh, thinking of using yeah. Chat GPT to write 
Sorry? You have a meeting. Oh, okay. Sure. To you. you. Yeah, you're welcome. To write letters of recommendation. Yeah. By feeding in a CV. Yeah. I don't expect to just use the product. No, you're it's going a nice. It's a nice starting. Right. You know, I can then modify it, right. elaborate on it, et cetera. And right. I could see a similar, uh, and it may already exist, where, where AI can provide a um, set of parameters and a and a differential diagnosis right. for a human being right. to then go in right. and approve or, right. or modify. Yeah. Which is, I think, a legitimate use. No, a, a time for a time efficient. I mean, the the, the just, just warning you about your upcoming uh, any letters of record. But but, <laughs> but but part of it is also a learning, and I, I can tell you, um, you know, I feel like I'm more efficient at being a diagnostician than I was five years ago. Right. 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 And right, so I but, feel like you're always but having, but having right. Um, so I'll take but, machine and, learning and I'll take any as a supplement. I'll yeah, take any yeah, advantage yeah, I can yeah. to, to become more accurate and become more efficient. So if that's if you can show me data where that's the case, right, right. Well, I think that's really I, I think that's very powerful. powerful. I think that's really right. Powerful. But I I don't think you're going to take a human being completely out of the diagnostic no, picture. I, I, I wouldn't think so. Yeah. I hope not. Yeah. I, any other questions or comments? I guess just going back to the question of cost, what is then how did like um test bands for scanners work uh for like cost in countries with universal health care? Uh well, I, I don't know if you've seen NHS, for example, is not doing really well. In the UK. Yeah, in the UK. Um <clears throat> and I I don't wanna I don't wanna we have lots of resources here in the United States, right? And places where they should have lots of resources, also how they put that as a value. Um, they don't have as much access. So I think the market system has helped us in some ways here, um, but it's a question of everyone's going to have to strike that balance. Like, this is the treatment. This is the cost of the imaging. How much do you want to put towards this problem in your country? If you have X Those amount of resources. Yeah. Social. It's a, it's, a, it's a value question. And I, I, can't solve, I can't solve that equation for another society. I, 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 getting back to Gabe's question, yeah. though, just in terms of the research costs, they were paying seven fifty now for an MRI. Yeah, about seven fifty. That's an hour. You get an hour in the scanner. Yeah. And five thousand, or is it six six thousand now for a PET? Uh, probably about five or six. Yeah, yeah. Just to give you an idea. Right. And those are discounted because they're research yeah. rates. And they can be. Uh, I mean, like our our uh, our colleagues at Yale are pay significantly more than we do. For research. Yeah, for research. Because we have a better deal. Yeah. So um it's it's not cheap. Thank but you. if you know if you know oh yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but it's beneficial, hopefully, to society. I mean that that's the idea. 